WEWN and St. Michael Productions presents The Beauty and Splendor of the New Catechism, featuring Douglas Bushman, Director of the Institute of Religious and Pastoral Studies at the University of Dallas. And now, Douglas Bushman and the Catechism Explained. We want to continue today our reflection on the theme of witness as it's found in the New Catechism of the Catholic Church. In our last reflection, we looked at how the Catechism stresses that the witness of Christians needs to be one that combines both words and actions. And we ended by saying that there was a vertical dimension to witness, that is a fidelity to God, and a horizontal dimension to witness. Witness is given out of the motive of love of neighbor by which one presents for that person in one's own life and words the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ so that those that we love can be set free by this truth. Perhaps one of the most straightforward and strongest statements on witness found in the Catechism is Article 1816. Here we read, The disciple of Christ must not only keep the faith and live on it, but also profess it, confidently bearing witness to it, and spread it. And then quoting the Second Vatican Council, 1816 continues, All, however, must be prepared to confess Christ before men and to follow him along the way of the cross amidst the persecutions which the church never lacks. Service of and witness to the faith are necessary for salvation. And the Catechism, to support this uh, assertion, quotes Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 to 33. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. So the service of and witness to the truth are necessary for salvation. But I would like to comment on this in terms of what we ended with in the last reflection. And that was that the motive for witness is love, love of God and love of neighbor. And we're going to develop this in terms of what the Catechism says about martyrdom. In Article 2473, we read, Martyrdom is the supreme witness given to the truth of the faith. And as perhaps everyone knows, in Greek, the word martyr means witness. It means bearing witness even unto death. The martyr bears witness to Christ who died and rose, to whom he is united by charity. He bears witness to the truth of the faith and of Christian doctrine. He endures death through an act of fortitude. And then, quoting St. Ignatius of Antioch, Article 2473 ends, Let me become the food of the beasts through whom it will be given me to reach God. Martyrdom is a supreme witness given to the truth of the faith. To be a martyr means to pose an unambiguous, an unequivocal sign of the fact that God and his truth are greater than we are and that God and his truth have a claim on our lives. The martyr is the person who has discovered the goodness of the truth, who has discovered that this truth is the pearl of great price, for which, in order to possess, it is worth selling everything else and the martyr sells even his own life in order to possess this truth and to remain faithful to it. What could possibly give the strength, what the Catechism has called the fortitude that is required to endure the loss of one's life in order to remain faithful to Jesus Christ? Love is the only power, is the only force powerful enough to enable a person to override the natural instinct to preserve his life in order to preserve a higher form of life, the life that comes from communion with God. I heard a priest once say that there is a fear which casts out all other fears. There's a fear that is so great that it can override every other fear in one's life. And this is the kind of fear which is the fruit of love. Anyone who is loved knows that to love makes a person, if I can say it this way, vulnerable. Parents who love their children fear that evil things might happen to their children. Anyone who loves wants what is good for the person who is loved. And the more that you want that good thing, 
in this case we're talking about eternal life, life in communion with God based on the truth that Jesus Christ has revealed. The more intensely a person wants that for himself and for those he loves, the more intensely he will fear not having it, the more intensely he will fear that it not come about and that the people that he loves, whether it's himself or others, will not enjoy the happiness and fulfillment that comes from being united with that good thing that will come with the freedom of the truth of Jesus Christ. Martyrdom is the supreme witness because it is unambiguous and unequivocal. Because in martyrdom, a person sacrifices the ultimate good, viewed at from a, a merely human point of view, that is life itself, in order to remain faithful to God. In Article 2474, following what we've just read on martyrdom, the Catechism writes, The Church has painstakingly collected the records of those who persevered to the end in witnessing to their faith. These are the acts of the martyrs. They form the archives of truth written in letters of blood. Very beautiful expression. But Article 2474 complements Article 2473 in a beautiful way in which we've seen that witness requires both an action and words. For those many martyrs whose circumstances were such that they gave actions only without words to give us the meaning of their actions, it's as if the church supplies the words to make clear and unambiguous what the meaning of their death was. It was, in actuality, a fidelity to Christ and to his truth. As we said then, just as the motive of martyrdom is charity, so also the motive of all who give witness needs to be charity. Though the Catechism has stated that it is an obligation to give witness, and that service of and witness to the faith are necessary for a salvation. The Catechism does not intend that this be an obligation by way of precept only, but it be an internal obligation, so that in giving witness there is a threefold fidelity. A fidelity to God, a fidelity to the Church which transmits the teachings of Jesus Christ, and a fidelity to oneself. This is based, of course, on Galatians 2.20. For I live now no longer I, but Christ lives in me. The obligation to bear witness does not come from without, but is an internal compelling because of this communion with Jesus Christ in the truth. The martyrs bear witness to this simplicity of the Christian life, to this communion, and to this new identity which they've taken on. All of us are called to be martyrs. As we know, one of Mary's titles is Queen of the Martyrs. Is this not the way of tradition to draw our attention to what is most formal and essential about martyrdom? Martyrdom is the outward action that gives witness to and is a sign pointing towards the interior death to oneself, which has resulted in a communion with Jesus Christ in the truth. Mary, Queen of the Martyrs, we have no record of her having died a martyr's death outwardly, but inwardly like her son, she conformed her life to the truth that she heard from God. She died to herself in order to live by doing God's will. She made God's will through her obedience her food for living, the living of her spiritual life, of course. And so Mary, as queen of the martyrs, points toward that which is most essential and formal about martyrdom. It's the interior identification with Christ and that interior fidelity to the truth based on and motivated by love, which is the life-giving force, the strength and the courage to forego earthly life for remaining in communion with Christ for eternal life. All of us are called to this type of witness. And so the Catechism quotes a passage from the Second Vatican Council's document on the missionary activity of the Church, I read in Article 2472 of the Catechism, All Christians, by the example of their lives and the witness of their word, wherever they live, have an obligation to manifest the new man which they have put on in baptism and to reveal the power of the Holy Spirit by whom they were strengthened at confirmation. A final text on our theme of witness comes from the fourth section of the Catechism, that is, on prayer, and it's Article 2685. And here we see the Catechism's very practical nature. The authors of the Catechism know that the first witness that people experience in their lives comes through the family. I read, 
The Christian family is the first place of education in prayer. Based on the sacrament of marriage, the family is the domestic church where God's children learn to pray as the church and to persevere in prayer. For young children in particular, daily family prayer is the first witness of the church's living memory as awakened patiently by the Holy Spirit. This is a very beautiful expression that family prayer is the first witness of the church's living memory as awakened patiently by the Holy Spirit, that can apply to many other elements of family life. The way that husbands and wives love one another is the first witness to children of Christian love in daily circumstances and events. The way that parents celebrate the sacraments is the first witness that children are going to receive with regard to sacramental life. The way that parents exercise stewardship over their material goods and their property, the way that they vote, the way that they conduct themselves in their economic and political life, and we could go on and on and on. In so many respects, the family, which is the fundamental cell of society and also of the church, is the first witness that each generation of Christians is exposed to with regard to this great good, which is the truth of the Christian faith. So we've seen through a, a long series of texts how important this theme of witness is in the new catechism of the Catholic Church. And I'd like to attempt by way of conclusion to suggest that this importance of witness simply continues in the church of today a pattern which was established on the birthday of the church, that is, on Pentecost. We can see the pattern of Christian witness very clearly if we reflect on exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. The event of Pentecost begins with a very powerful manifestation of the Holy Spirit in the form of wind and tongues of fire, and also in the form of the fact that people who spoke many different languages were able to hear the message of the apostles in their own native tongue. Now, all of these outward signs, these actions, drew the attention of the crowd which assembled, and therefore the crowd had some questions What's going on here? And a dialogue began. It was a dialogue that began with the initiative of God, with these external signs. And the people posed a question. The question was, isn't it a little bit early in the day for these men to be so drunk? You remember, that was their way of trying to understand what was happening. We might say theologically, they attempted an explanation of the event in natural terms only. But this gave rise to a long discourse on the part of St. Peter. And the first thing that he does is he says, no, there is no natural explanation for what is taking place here. This event can only be explained in terms of God's activity. In fact, it is the Holy Spirit promised by God himself in the prophet Joel. And so St. Peter is reported as having read a passage from the prophet Joel and said that this passage now has come to reality. It is fulfilled in your very midst. But notice that already the first thing that Peter does is identify what the source is for an outwardly visible action, and he gives God the credit for it. He points to its transcendent cause. That is, it's the Holy Spirit. But then Peter takes another step. This action, the events that are happening right now, certainly are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit himself must be connected with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And so Peter goes on to make that connection. As our Lord himself said in chapter 7 of John's Gospel, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me. Let anyone who believes in me come and drink. As Scripture says, From his heart shall flow streams of living water. Now, it's as if John understood clearly that this would be a very difficult passage for people to comprehend, and so he provides for us a little explanation. In verse 39 of chapter 7, he writes, He was speaking of the Spirit which those who believed in him were to receive, for there was no Spirit as yet, because Jesus had not yet been glorified. He hadn't been raised up on the cross, and he hadn't yet risen from the dead and ascended to the Father, and therefore there was no Spirit yet. Our Lord himself made the connection between his sacrifice and the coming of the Holy Spirit very explicit in chapter 16 of John's Gospel, verse 7. Still I am telling you the truth. It is for your own good that I am going. 
because unless I go, the paraclete will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. As a result of the words of St. Peter, Luke records that the people were cut to the heart. That means that his words penetrated to the depth of their being, and then they responded, what must we do? And Peter told them, you must be baptized, and you must receive the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, there is, if I can say, a schematic presentation of what happened on the day of Pentecost, but that applies to the witness that all Christians give. By the quality of their life and the words which offer an explanation to the way that they live, Christians are called, first and foremost, to identify that what they're doing and what they're saying comes from the Holy Spirit. This cannot be explained naturally. Even though my actions might not appear to be all that different from those around me, nevertheless, my motivation, what I have in mind in what I'm doing here, is a gift that comes from the revelation of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within me. So it's the Holy Spirit who prompts me and moves me to act as I do. But now the Christian in giving a witness needs to go one step further as St. Peter did. This Holy Spirit is himself the fruit of, of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that's why all Christian witness is simultaneously a witness to the Holy Spirit and his power living among us and transforming our lives on the one hand, but also to the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. For it's by his passing over to the Father that Jesus is able to send the Spirit into our hearts. So a complete Christian witness, actions, with words, comes to its fullness when we celebrate the Holy Eucharist, the sacrifice of Christ, which was and remains for the church, the great act of Jesus Christ by which he brings forth the power of the Holy Spirit and sends the Spirit upon the earth. All of our actions and all of our words take on a fullness of meaning in the context of the Holy Eucharist. And now we can understand those passages that we read earlier on in a prior reflection that said that the fruit of the liturgical celebrations of the church is precisely this bearing of a witness to Jesus Christ. We must bear witness to Christ in our lives because it's the Holy Spirit whom we receive in all of the liturgical celebrations of the church and the sacraments. But the Spirit himself bears witness to Christ, points to Christ and his sacrifice as the very source of the outpouring of the Spirit who transforms our lives. I think that it's in light of this development of the theme of witness that we've just completed that we can better understand another theme that the Catechism develops, and that is the theme of scandal. And the Catechism presents its most lengthy treatment of the subject of scandal, beginning with Article 2284. We read, Scandal is an attitude or behavior which leads another to do evil. The person who gives scandal becomes his neighbor's tempter. He damages virtue and integrity. He may even draw his brother into spiritual death. Scandal is a grave offense if by deed or omission another is deliberately led into a grave offense. Here we see that scandal is precisely the opposite of witness. By witness, a person's life and words, one's deeds and actions and words, show forth the presence of the transforming presence and power of the Holy Spirit, who is the fruit of Christ's sacrifice. The purpose of witness is to present the world with the truth that was revealed in Jesus Christ. Scandal is the opposite because scandal is an attitude or behavior which leads another to do evil. It falsifies what true human happiness is, what our fulfillment is as images of God. The one who gives scandal becomes his neighbor's tempter, and damages virtue and integrity, which are based on the truth. So scandal is the opposite of Christian witness. By scandal, a person's actions distort the truth rather than communicate it, and what they do communicate is falsehood about human fulfillment in Christ. We can think of many examples that are prevalent in our society today, and perhaps even in the church. This would include Actions and words that make evil appear glamorous, actually that make evil appear as a good. For example, we think of slow motion 
cameras that are used in making films that glamorize the pleasures of the body, sexual pleasures, or even the way that sports can be blown out of proportion by glamorizing the thrill of victory and the response of many, many people to an extraordinary athletic feat. Now, in this case, it's not that athletics or sports are evil in themselves, but by overly glamorizing them, they can take on the lure of promising more fulfillment and more happiness than they can ever deliver. Scandal can also happen by making light of fundamental responsibilities. For instance, when a group or a teacher should play down the importance of the obligation to seek the truth and to assent to the truth once it's discovered and to live according to it. Think of what happens in a situation when uh, a person is in a group that's contemplating doing something that presents a conflict in that person's conscience. An individual has the original, the initial courage to say, I'm not sure that we should do this. And then the crowd responds by saying, oh, lighten up. Don't rain on the parade. After all, is this really so bad? When teachers, when catechists, when homilists undermine legitimate authority, for instance, the teaching authority of the pope or the bishops, when they undermine it by belittling it or by making it appear as in some way contradictory with regard to right reason, opposed to reasonableness, then such people are creating an environment in which a person feels that he or she has to choose, on the one hand, between being faithful to the church and the church's teaching authority, and on the other hand, being faithful to reason which is also a gift from God. How could two gifts from God be opposed in such a way? Indeed, they cannot be, but it seems that many people are presenting this dilemma for many of the faithful. This is why the Catechism goes on in Article 2285 to teach that scandal takes on a particular gravity by reason of the authority of those who cause it or the weakness of those who are scandalized. It prompted our Lord to utter this curse. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Scandal is grave when given by those who by nature or office are obliged to teach and educate others. Jesus reproaches the scribes and Pharisees on this account. He likens them to wolves in sheep's clothing. The Catechism goes on in Article 2287, Anyone who uses the power at his disposal in such a way that it leads others to do wrong becomes guilty of scandal and responsible for the evil that he has directly or indirectly encouraged. Temptations to sin are sure to come, but woe to him by whom they come. This is how the Catechism closes Article 2287, quoting Luke chapter 17, verse 1. An example of scandal that the Catechism gives comes in Article 2291, and it shows that this is a Catechism for our own times. We read, the use of drugs inflicts very grave damage on human health and life. Their use, except on strictly therapeutic grounds, is a grave offense. Clandestine production of and trafficking in drugs are scandalous practices. They constitute direct cooperation in evil since they encourage people to practices gravely contrary to the moral law. What the Catechism teaches about scandal, which I have presented as the reverse and the opposite of what it teaches about witness, is based upon the Catechism's teaching regarding the social nature of the human person. In Article 1702, we read, The divine image is present in every man. It shines forth in the communion of persons, in the likeness of the union of the divine persons among themselves. And then in Article 1879, we read, The human person needs to live in society. Society is not for him an extraneous addition, but a requirement of his nature. Through the exchange with others, mutual service, and dialogue with his brethren, man develops his potential. He thus responds to his vocation. But he also affects those around him. And this effect can be either good through Christian witness or evil through scandal. And so the Catechism shows that there is much more at stake in our actions than just our own well-being or our individual salvation. Every action done by a Christian, done out of faith, hope, and charity, 
can be used by God as a witness through which the gospel can show the power of its truth and radiance before men, that is, the power to draw men to the faith and to God, as we read in Article 2044. And in this we see yet another reason for the importance of a passage we've seen in a prior reflection, that is Article 828, where, quoting John Paul II, the Catechism writes, The saints have always been the source and origin of renewal in the most difficult moments in the Church's history. And the reason for this is because the saints live in communion with God and make his goodness present to those around them through the life and the actions and the words of holy men and women and those striving for holiness. A great sign is posited by which the church, which is the great sign and sacrament of salvation, continues the mission of Christ in the world today. If you like this entire catechism series on 13 audio tapes presented by Douglas Bushman, or if you'd like to write to Douglas Bushman, please write to St. Michael Productions, P.O. Box 168485, Irving, Texas, 75016-8485. That address again is St. Michael Productions, P.O. Box 168. 485 Irving, Texas 75016-8485 If you'd like a copy of today's cassette program, please specify tape number 110. Thank you for joining us today for the Catechism Explained with Douglas Bushman. Mm-hmm.